morning. Good morning. I didn't want to interrupt Grace's beautiful piano playing, so thank you again for playing for us. So a few announcements this morning. First of all, tonight there is a patio party at John and Debbie Nelson's house. If you need their address, you can talk to them or speak to one of the pastors, and we will make sure that you have that. It starts at 6.30. As well, this coming Saturday, we are hosting the Saturday Lunch Program. So we need about 12 helpers minimum to run that. And so we hope that some of you will step up and, and be part of that. I think I shared a few weeks ago how meaningful it was to me to be part of it. And it's so well run, I promise you, it will be a positive experience. It's very smooth. You come 10.30, I believe. Okay, 10.30 and you're done by 1.30 at the latest. I'm getting the thumbs up, so I'm giving the right information. That's good. And then um, one more thing, we have a block party and barbecue at Heather and Joel's house in two weeks. So on August 6th, oops, sorry. On August 6th, there will be a block party, not too far from here. I have my purse on today, that was a terrible idea. Um, there are some sign-up sheets. It's really helpful, just like the barbecue at my farm, it's really helpful to kind of have an idea of how many people are coming. So if you would please take a moment, if you are planning to come over the next couple of weeks here, sign up on here, just put your name and how many people are attending, and we look forward to that time together. Let us now join in worship. Please rise as you're able. Let the whole world bless our God and loudly sing his praises. Our lives are in his hands, and he keeps our feet from stumbling. Let us pray. Here we are, Lord, filled with life and breath, citizens in the land of the living by your grace. You know our paths and the help that we need to keep our feet firm. In this time of worship, equip us to be your upright followers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let's welcome one another.
Nice to see everybody. Some of you are back from holidays. Some of you have been here the whole time. You're back from holidays. Yeah, I know I go on holidays next week, so you won't see me for a couple of weeks. But I am excited to be here. <laughs> so this morning, uh, there's a story, a parable, like we were talking about, right? So stories that t teach us something about God or the way that God works in this world. And that story was about a servant, and he owed his master a lot of money. Now, I'm not going to get into how much, but let's just say around a million dollars, okay? So if you owed somebody a million dollars, how would you pay that back? How would you pay back a million dollars? I don't know either. I don't know where I'd find a million dollars. Well, that was the same thing as him, and his, his um, the, the person in charge, sorry, I can't think of the name, um, he said to him, you have to pay me back right now or I'm going to sell you and your family and everything you own. And the man was very scared. And he begged him, he said, please, please, I'm so sorry, like, I will be your servant forever, I will help you in any way I can, I, just, I can't pay right now. And you know what? The landlord felt really compassionate for him, and he forgave the whole million dollars. Can you imagine saying, ah, it's okay, you don't have to pay me back a million dollars. Well, that same man, yeah, he'd be pretty excited. That's right, I saw a little like this. <laughs> Very excited. I think I'd do a happy dance. Yes, exactly, a big happy dance. Well, he went outside, though. So the man who'd just been forgiven $1 million, right? He went outside, and he saw a guy on the street who owed him $100. What do you think he did for that guy? You think he forgave him? You know what? He didn't. Can you imagine being forgiven a million dollars and then you won't forgive somebody a hundred dollars that they owe you? Well, his master found out and he was very upset with him. And he said, I forgave you all of this and you couldn't even forgive this tiny little bit. You need to go out of my sight. Well, that story is a bit about forgiveness. And it seems, in that story, it seems really easy, right? But we, God has forgiven us everything. No matter what we do, God has said, if we tell him we are sorry, we confess what we have done, it will be forgiven. No, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, right? It's just forgiven. But God says, you must also forgive those who hurt you. So I have a question for you. If Grace here, every time she walked by me, she stomped on my toe as hard as she could. Every time, 100 times, she stomped on my toe. How am I going to be feeling? Am I going to want to forgive her? No. The first time, I might be like, OK, that was an accident. The second time, I'd be like, Grace, watch where you're walking. Right? Grace wouldn't do that, by the way. <laughs> but after 100 times? Jesus says, even after a hundred times, we need to forgive because it hurts us if we don't forgive and it puts a block between us and God. So let's pray and ask God to help us with those hard things. Jesus, we thank you that you died on the cross so that we could be forgiven for everything and anything. You are so, so good to us. And Lord, help us not to forget when somebody hurts us that we also need to forgive them, just like you forgave us. We pray that you would help us do that even with people who are not kind to us over and over again. Show us ways to not be in their way of harm, but to forgive them anyway. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go downstairs. We come to a part of the service that perhaps for many of us in an evangelical church is unusual, the prayer of confession. 
I know it is something that I have come to feel I cannot do without on a Sunday. How could I stand up here in front of all of you without a chance to say that I am only here by the grace of God? I only join you, my betters, by the grace of God. We confess our sins every Sunday with the hopes that somehow it might become a reflex for us to acknowledge before the people we meet throughout the week that we are sinners, that we have sinned and fallen short. Please join me in a prayer of confession. Almighty and most holy God, when we hear you call us by name, we come. We recognize that you have opened the way for us into your presence through Jesus Christ. And that you send your spirit to bring us into your presence and to be with us. But as we stand in the light of your holiness, we begin to see clearer and clearer day by day of our life. We see clearer, more clearly, that we have fallen short. How short we have fallen in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our, in our actions, and how we fall short by leaving things undone that we know we ought to have done. You, we know that you have given us everything we need for holiness. You have forgiven us you have set us free from sin and death and the devil. You have filled us with your Holy Spirit. And yet we have fallen short again. Like the servant before the master in the parable your son taught us, we begin to glimpse the magnitude of our sin. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Restore us and fill us with your spirit once again and help us to live disciplined and godly lives to the glory of your name. Amen. We also confess every Sunday in order that we might hear the words spoken over us that having confessed your sins, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand as you're able? What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I
Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson is uh, today taken from the book of Genesis, and we're chapter 50, and I'm going to be reading verses 15 through 19, and I'm going to be reading this out of the Old King James Version, uh, 1611 authorized version. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, The father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sins. For they did evil unto, for they did unto the evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place, for am I in the place of God? Our responsorial lesson is taken from Psalm 119. It's found on page four of your service bulletin. Please join me in reading responsively. Remember your word to your servant, in which you have made me hope. The arrogant utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your ordinances yeah, from of old, I take comfort, O oh Lord. Indignation seizes me because of the wicked, those who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs wherever I make my home. I remember your name in the night, O oh Lord, and keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me, for I have kept your precepts. Glory be to the Father, and to Please stand as you're able for, to read the gospel lesson. And our gospel lesson today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. And I'm going to be reading verses 21 to 35. And this is going to be out of the Good News Bible. The parable of the unforgiving servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times can my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him? Seven times? No, not seven times, answered Jesus, but 70 times seven. Because the kingdom of heaven is like a king 
who decided to check on his servant's account. He had begun to do this when one of them servants was brought in before him and he owed him many millions of dollars. He did not have enough to pay his debt. So his master ordered him to be sold as a slave with his wife and his children and all that he had in order to pay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before his master. Be patient with me, he say, begged, and I will p pay you everything. The master had pity on him and felt sorry for him, so he forgave him the debt and let him go. The man went out and met one of his fellow servants who had owed him a few dollars. He grabbed him and started choking him. Pay back what you will owe me, he said. His fellow servants fell down and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he would not. Instead, he had him thrown into prison until he should pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were very upset and went to their master and told him everything. So the master called the servant in. You worthless slave, he said. I forgave you the whole amount you owed me just because you asked me to. You should have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you. The master was very angry and he sent his servant to prison, jail, to be punished until he should pay back the whole amount. And Jesus concluded, that is how my Father in heaven will treat you if you do not forgive your brother, every one of you, from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus' parable is clearly about forgiving others. But in my mind, I, I think that part is clear to us. We must forgive. I would like to make a further connection, and that is to judgment. We ought to also to be careful about judging others. To me, these two ideas seem connected closely. If you are going to forgive, there must be something you have judged to be wrong in order to have to forgive the person. And so what comes out of our hearts that is judgment and what comes out of our hearts that withholds, uh, that withholds forgiveness to me seems connected. I want to focus instead on the, how this parable can possibly, might possibly help us change our hearts so that we have a more gracious stance towards one another and the people we meet in life. It seems to me in our culture today there is a lack of graciousness on all sides, that we are quick to judge and that we, are, that we tend to withhold forgiveness. This is especially evident in politics. We are quick to see our political position and group as being blameless and righteous in all of its actions and to impute the greatest evil to those who have different opinions from us politically. The things that we are saying these days, the conversations that we tolerate about human beings, fellow human beings who have stepped into political office are such that they cannot be repeated here from this pulpit. There is a lack of graciousness on all sides. It seems the same pattern is in our relationships as well. We are quick to observe and name faults all around us. I was out biking with my daughter, and she was on the side, we were on the sidewalk. She's 12, and she's learning how to bike. And uh, she rang her bell well in advance, and this fellow turned around and went, oh, scoffed at her. 
I said, she's just 12. And he said, well, you're not. And then he was not, he was not going to be convinced otherwise that something, some injustice had not been done, committed against him. But this is the pattern on our streets, as we drive, as we stand in line, as we are served by other people, as we go to the hospital and are served. It is just so obvious what a lack of graciousness there is all around us. And even in our closest relationships, our marriages, our family relationships, we find ourselves demanding our rights and our well-being coming first. The Old Testament lesson was taken from Genesis and the story of Joseph and perhaps the connection to the unmerciful servant isn't obvious. Joseph, if anyone, had something to forgive. Taken as a young man by his own brothers, they faked his death and sold him into slavery, presuming they would never see him again. Only at the end of their lives to find out that they were at his mercy and needed his help in order to survive. And here it is obvious that they feared to the very end that he had held on to his resentment and had not forgiven. When their father passed away, their presumption was that there was nothing would hold Joseph back from getting even, for a wrong had been committed. But Joseph responded strangely. He didn't just say, I forgive you. He said, I am not in the place of God. It seems a strange answer to give somebody. But if you go back to the first chapters of Genesis, perhaps the author of Genesis is wanting to echo the wrong that set off all the other wrongs. The snake came to Adam and Eve and said, eat of this fruit. God doesn't want you to eat it because God knows that if you eat of this, then you will be like God. You will be able to judge for yourself between right and wrong. And so Joseph, at the conclusion of the book of Genesis, stands before people who he knows have done wrong and says, of course, I must forgive you. And it is not my place to judge. I am not God. There could not be any more powerful statement made to us, encouraging us that we must forgive and that we must be very careful about judging others. There are a few things I want to draw out of the parable itself, but it seems that I probably should say something about our expression, forgive and forget. I think every sermon on this topic feels it needs to address forgive and forget because it is such a hold on us. In the parable of the unmerciful servant, there is an accounting. The debts are listed and read through and named. It is God who judges. But we have to remember repeatedly, how repeatedly throughout the Old Testament and the New, we are told that God will forget our sins. Remember them no more. And surely, we are not going to suggest that there's something God can't do. If God sets out to forget something, I am presuming that God is capable of doing it. And so our goal in life, the end to which we are all moving through the redemption brought into the world by Jesus Christ, is a kind of forgetting that at the moment I do not understand. I glimpse it sometimes, when I am so happy and so content with some other person that I forget the wrongs they have done to me completely. And maybe they bring it up in the moment and I'll think, oh, that's right. <laughs> but there was a kind of forgetfulness that took place. For now, though, there is wisdom in saying we do not forget. We do not forget in order to prevent sins from happening again. 
And some of the things that we try to remember as a society, we do that because not only do we not want to continue in this way, but we sense that still the, the impact of those evils are being continued. It seems hard for many of us to be in City Hall underneath the banners written in indigenous languages surrounded by the tents of those who are homeless and struggling with mental illness and terrible addiction not to see how a disproportionate number of them are indigenous. We remember the sins of the past that we might try and make restitution, that we might try and prevent it from happening again. We try to remember in order to protect those who are vulnerable. We do this keeping in mind that our hope is one day there will be a forgetting as we are one people under God. But from the parable of Jesus, I think there are several things that we might reflect upon in order to have our hearts changed, that we might be forgiving and less judgmental. And the first thing that jumps out to me from this parable is that you are forgiven. Now, the story is about someone who owed a talent. A talent is a weight. Maybe you've heard all of this before many times. A talent is a weight. It may have been a talent of gold. It may have been a talent of silver. Most likely silver, I've been told. One talent of silver would, some suggest, be about 15 years of wages for the average laborer. 15 years for one talent. And Jesus has suggested that this servant owed 10,000 talents. In other words, 150,000 years worth of labor would be needed to pay off this debt. In today's estimations, using what might be uh, our average salaries, we are talking about something like four to eight trillion dollars of debt. Jesus is being silly, I think. I don't know when you, if you did this when you were younger, with the, and you would taunt your sibling or your friends, and you'd say, I, I have a million billion gazillion dollars. And you'd, invent, you'd, well, you'd invent these names for huge amounts of money. This is probably the idea here. Jesus is saying, uh, the servant came forward, the books were opened, and he owed a gazillion dollars. It's silly, and yet, as we read it, we know it is so deadly serious. Because it is clear that we are meant to understand that that is me, standing before the master. That debt he is describing is my debt. It's not money. It's all the wrongs that I've done in life. Gazillions. <laughs> and it's a dramatic scene, if you can imagine it. The servant is there before the master, and it's a participle. It's an ongoing action here at the moment. They are making an account. He is standing there. The books are being opened, and you can see the accountant and the master reading through it and tallying everything up, calculating the debt. One day, each one of us will stand before Jesus Christ, whom we now call King we confess that he will be our judge. How long a list will it be? Paul tells us every secret thought will be judged. Jesus himself earlier in Matthew has said, every careless word you will be held accountable for. It's usually comforting to speak on a subject about which you are an expert. 
And this is one, when it comes to careless words, this is one in which I am an expert. I think the expression nowadays is that you need 10,000 hours of something to become good at it. I, I'm pretty sure I have passed that when it comes to careless words. Now you think you're always right. If I had a dollar for every time somebody has said that to me in life. You think you're better than other people. I think that's not me. I'm really nice. But I have a lifetime of these accusations in my thoughts and words and deeds, and I have left other things undone. It will be a long list, and not just for me, even though I couldn't make the, such a long list for all you wonderful people. <laughs> it will be a long list. I know this only because of God's word. In the, servant, in the story, the servant falls down before the master and begs for patience. I will repay it. Now, of course, this is absurd. There is no way that the servant is going to repay this amount of money. It's impossible. But the master doesn't enter into rational discussion here. The master doesn't debate it or argue. The master doesn't try to help the servant understand the magnitude of what we are talking about. Instead, the master forgives the entire amount. He was asked to be patient, but he forgave everything. Many lifetimes worth of debt forgiven. There is an accounting. And the servant had to ask for forgiveness and had to admit that the debt was theirs. But having confessed, the servant was forgiven. And this is why we practice the prayer of confession every Sunday, and I hope you practice it every day. Confess, and I hope every day you hear those words. You are forgiven. I hope this because I am convinced that over time, ever how slowly it seems, at least in my heart, over time we are changed and our hearts are softened. It becomes easier for us to admit when we've done something wrong. It becomes easier for us not to judge. It becomes easier for us to forgive others. You are forgiven. And why are we forgiven? In the parable, it is nothing offered. The servant does not offer anything in way of compensation. The servant is not able to offer any argument or any explanation or any excuses. It is simply because God loves you that you are forgiven. When we forgive in our culture today, especially, it seems we, we often quickly default to trying to explain why the wrong was done in the first place, as if to mitigate it, to minimize it, to soften it. We point to the circumstances. Well, we say, well, this was going on in my life, and this was happening, and that's why I, I, I did this. And sometimes that seems to help even. Or look at everything that's gone on in this person's life. Look at everything they've been, to, been through. Of course they're making these choices now. Or we point to misunderstanding. Oh, that's not what I meant. You misunderstood me, and then I misunderstood you, and that's why we're in marriage counseling. No. <laughs> or we point to stress. I just, I'm under so much pressure. Or it's just been one thing after another today. And so the other last night, Maisie, when I kicked your trombone uh, case in the middle of our hallway floor in the dark, and I said, Maisie Willow, I'm sorry. It was one thing after another. Or we could point to past hurts or trauma, and we say, this, this person or I have been through so much, and I almost can't control my response. Or in some cases, especially in those cases where the evil just seems so exaggerated and so extreme, we throw our hands up and say, this must be some form of 
terrible mental illness. No one could choose to be so evil. Now the Bible does say something like this. Jesus himself on the cross says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When Paul talks about doing wrong, he says, we do it because we're trapped, we're enslaved, we're helpless. But the awkward part is that we are still accountable. In spite of all the excuses, in spite of all the reasons we might give, in the end we are still accountable according to Scripture, according to Jesus. God does not excuse wrong. God holds perpetrators and victims equally to account. The servant stood before the master and the account was taken, it was opened up and gone through. He owed his life, his family's life, many lifetimes he owed and he appealed for mercy. Now why did God forgive? In the good news version we heard he had compassion i think in the nrsv it's he had pity out of pity for him but in i'm afraid to say in the greek we this english just does not do justice to the greek here in the greek it's splanknia such a great word hard to forget and it means in your very bowels in your very guts. The master wasn't just reasoning out the pros and cons. The master wasn't just doing what was right and being out of his duty. The master in his very guts, in his very bowel, was moved. And we talk about feeling something in our hearts or from the bottom of our hearts, but maybe you've had an experience where your stomach itself was moved. Maybe we, you've thought you were so terrified in a moment it, your stomach clenched and you could feel it or you were so full of grief that your stomach was in knots you were so worked up that your stomach was churning the master looks at his servant hears his appeal and in his guts in his bowels he is moved with compassion This is what the master felt for his servant. And this is what God feels for you. When you stand before God, it is in God's very bowels that God is moved with compassion for you. It is not rational calculation. It is not duty. It is not God saying, well, this is, I guess I have to do this. This is just who I am. God is moved with compassion for you. When you confess and ask for mercy, God forgives you completely because God loves you so deeply. But it is necessary for you to forgive others from the bottom of your heart. In the parable, the servant leaves and immediately, as we've heard twice already and now you're here a third time the servant leaves and immediately meets a fellow servant who owes him money and he grabs him by the neck pay back what you owe and his fellow servant pleads for mercy and the amount that the servant owes in today's dollars might be something like ten to twenty thousand dollars certainly significant amount certainly something real and tangible Pay back what you owe. And instead of having mercy, he has his fellow servant and his whole family thrown in jail. When the master hears, he summons this servant and says, You wicked servant, I forgave you gazillions, and you would not forgive ten, twenty thousand dollars. In the NRSV, in the Good News version, we heard, hand it over to the jailers. But in the Greek, it is much more stark. 
hand him over to the torturers until he has repaid all of it. And Jesus says, and this is what my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister. Stark, blunt, ruthless words from Jesus Christ. Throughout Matthew's gospel, Jesus has this little church that he is planting in view, this little group of disciples that he is bringing together. And he sees how, what a struggle it will be for them to get along. Matthew's teaching over and over again is about how we ought to treat each other, how we ought to try and get along, how we are to deal with unresolved problems in our relationships here and now in the church. And it's here in this passage that it's impossible to miss a warning that the unresolved problems we have in relationships here on earth will impact the next life. It is said that there is an unforgivable sin in Matthew. It is described as speaking against the Holy Spirit. But here it seems like there might be a second one. That if we do not forgive someone, there will be consequences and eternity for us. Jesus, just a few verses earlier, has said, have you Is there a relationship right now in which you are bound and tied up? Then it has been bound in heaven. Is there a relationship that you have opened up, that you have set free, that you've loosened? It has been loosened in heaven. Jesus said earlier in Matthew, if you know someone has something against you, leave your gift at the altar, go now and make it right. Jesus goes on to say, do not judge. Take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. And he warns us, with the judgment you judge, you will be judged in return. Again, eternal implications from forgiveness and judgment. And we prayed, and we will shortly pray, every day, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. My sense is that relationships will need to be set right at one point or another. Sooner or later. And sooner, I think, will be far easier. Let us us not put off apologizing and forgiving people while we still have a chance. Now God is merciful and loving, not quick to anger, not eager to see anyone suffer, is patient, hoping for all to come to salvation. And we are forgiven from the bottom of God's heart. But to forgive others from the bottom of our hearts can be extremely hard, if not in some circumstances, honestly, impossible for us. It is necessary to turn to God and to admit this. To admit how hard it is for us to forgive someone or even a whole group of people. But it is necessary for us to forgive from the bottom of our hearts. It seems to me that if we meditate on this parable, if we let it sink into our hearts, maybe there can be a change in us we begin to understand the magnitude of our sins. Just how many there are. Just how much God forgives us. Perhaps in our hearts as we meditate on this, we begin to see even more clearly the depth of God's love for us. The depth of mercy that God has shown us. And it is my experience, and I wish I could say it had, been, had more of an impact in my life than it has, but it is my experience that meditating on God's love and mercy somehow changes my heart and softens it and helps me to love other people even just a little bit more. Helps me to loosen my need to protect myself and justify my behavior and to forgive and to apologize. 
I think Jesus is trying to change our stance towards other people. Our perception of other people while changing our perception of ourselves. Can we be more gracious in political conversations as we talk about you fill in the, the, the blank, whatever name you want to put in there, as you talk about that fellow human being, can you be more gracious in how you talk about him or her? Can we be more gracious in all of our interactions throughout the day? In the quick ones, when we're meeting people in the street or someone is serving us, can we be more gracious in those moments? Can we be more gracious in our thoughts and hearts as we evaluate the behavior of others? Can we try and see things in the best possible light instead of the worst? But most of all, is there anyone I need to apologize to? Is there anyone I need to get a hold of? Is there anyone I need to forgive? Let us do these things right now for the glory of God and relying on his power and love at work in us. Amen. The hymn of response is... Uh found in your hymnal on page 505 called Love Lifted Me. It's also in your bulletin on page 5. If you please stand as we sing.
Please be seated. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we worship you because we do believe that it is good and it is right to do so. Please hear our prayers this morning and may your spirit give strength to all your people as they work and as they witness in your world. Unite us in your truth and in your love and help us to show that love to others but to also be changed by your love. We pray for the church universal and for those who lead and serve here at First Baptist Church. May you give them unity, wisdom, joy, energy, and clarity as they minister to the many needs of both our church and our community. And we think now as well of our, our partners in ministry in the CBWC, our denomination, and in the CBM. Bless especially the work of our missions committee as they continue to find ways to support and encourage the Boutros family as they serve and witness the light of Christ in Lebanon. We remember especially those who have died and returned to you. We think of them now. Be with those who have loved or lost a loved one. And please comfort them. We pray for those in need, for those who are sick or anxious or in hospital, or those who are in a place of discomfort or waiting, anxiety, for those who are lonely or isolated, all those who are known and especially those who are unknown to us. Provide them with care and comfort and be merciful to them. Comfort all who are suffering in body, in mind, and spirit, we think of Martha. We think of Merv, who is at home and recovering from his stroke. We think of Gary, who has had a successful operation, but, but who is now struggling with COVID. Lord, please, please bring healing and comfort to those who need it, but also to those who love and look after these people. Again, for those who are known and unknown to us, bring peace and healing. For those who are seeking employment or who have extra financial burden at this time, please provide for their needs. We think of the many homeless in our city and in our province, those in despair. Provide them hope. Give answers to those who are camped outside City Hall, for the leaders inside City Hall, so that there may be a resolution, especially as we we know that fall and winter will be coming. Provide hope and wisdom in situations that seem to be so hopeless. We do pray for the people in the places where there continues to be political tension, war, famine, and destruction. We pray for those who continue to suffer in Somalia and Sudan and the Middle East, in Ukraine and Russia and especially West Africa, where there continues to be continual violence and terrorism. We think of those in the east of Canada who have experienced immense flooding and the fires that continue to rage all across this nation. Let these tensions and conflicts not escalate, but instead encourage there to be leadership that seeks peace for all involved and seeks good resolution. We pray for our local leaders and our provincial leaders, our national leaders, and the leaders of the opposition. We pray for those who are called to speak truth to power. May you help each of us and may you help them participate in a democracy of healing and care, and a care and concern for all, especially those who are often voiceless and disempowered. May you work through us, and may your spirit work through us and in our world. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We recognize that these gifts are a small portion of the ways in which God has poured out many blessings in our lives, both spiritually, financially, with our gifts, with our lives. And we recognize that this is only a portion given back, but we do so and give this back to God in a belief that God will work and minister to the needs of our people, both here in our city and beyond. Lord, bring grace. Amen. As you go, go with the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peace be upon the whole community, and love with faith, and grace be upon all those who have an undying love for the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be all the glory together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the one God, now and forever. Amen. And one last thing, if you're coming to uh, John and Debbie's tonight to see the nicest lawn in Regina at John and Debbie's for the patio party, nicest lawn in Regina, if you could bring patio chairs, they don't, uh, uh, and if you're coming. You're, and rain or shine is happening. They'll set up the patio chairs inside and we'll, yeah, there we are. You're, and everyone's welcome to come. Thanks.